live sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm the Education and Volunteer Manager here at El Rancho de las Colondrinas Living History Museum, located just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley. Bear with us today. Um, we know the lighting is a little bit off. We had some great cloud coverage, but they've since moved on. We wanted to broadcast today from a little bit more of an intimate space here on the ranch here in the Golondrinas Placita. Today, the uh, topic that we're going to be covering is going to be a little bit more about the history of spinning and loom wool weaving here in New Mexico. If you've been joining us for our Golondrinas live session since late July, our second session on August 7th featured um, another Las Golondrinas weaver and spinner, Patricia, Patricia Tucker, and she started the conversation about the sheep to blanket um, weaving program here at Las Golondrinas. So joining me today is Kathy Greco, who's going to continue that conversation, and she'll be expanding a little bit more about the interesting and intricate process of this beautiful fiber art. She's going to be sharing with us a little bit about um, malacate and um, loom spinning. She's going to talk a little bit about the construction of some of the tools and materials used in the fiber art process. She's going to uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of the history of this fiber art in New Mexico. Um, if you missed the fourth or the second uh, Las Golondrinas live session with Patricia that's still available right here on our Facebook dated August 7th. Um, so make sure to catch that. So Kathy has been a weaver for 16 years. She's been spinning for 24 years and we're fortunate enough to have her here as a weaver and spinner at Las Golondrinas for the past eight years. So she really is an expert on the subject. So if at any time during this segment you have any questions, please put those in the comments and we'll make sure to answer those for you. So without further delay, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today, Kathy Greco. Thank you so much, Kathy. Take it away. Well, thank you. I get to take my mask off. It's great. Um, the history of the Malacate, it was brought over from Europe to the New World by the Spanish when they came to Mexico. Uh, the Malacate is a type of support spindle. It's down on the ground. And they've been around for thousands of years. Um, the Spanish brought them over to Mexico, and then they were brought up here to New Mexico. The nice thing about a malacate is they are easy to make. If you notice, it is a stick of wood and some kind of heavy whirl on the bottom. Uh, the whirl can either be wood, as mine is. <clears throat> it could be made out of clay. It could also be a, a stone uh, put on the bottom. So it's, it's a, quite an easy uh, item to make. The other thing about a malacate is they are so portable. If I had to go down and take care of the sheep out in the fields, I take my malacate and my wool with me, and I can be spinning down there. Whereas in a spinning wheel, it's not very uh, portable. Now, before you start spinning, uh, as Patricia had indicated in her previous session, the wool had to be washed. And this mostly is because if you are going to dye the wool, if you do not get the lanolin out of the wool, it will not take the dye. So we would wash the wool. Then the next step is to card it. Now I have a pair of modern carding combs here. They apparently use teasel, which is a plant that's got kind of barbs on it. And I imagine people also tried to make uh, carding combs. To do it, you would take the fiber, put it down upon the uh, uh, the card of one side, take the other one, have them in opposite directions, and then pull. And you may wonder now, who would have done the carding? Well, the children would have done the washing and the carding because the women and eight, nine-year-old girls would be eventually doing the spinning. So spinning was taught fairly early, and some people just take to it very quickly. I've had some really good students. Once it's been combed, which straightens the fiber out, it also cleans it somewhat. You can get kind of the little short pieces and dirt out. 
You then roll it up into what's called a colita, or a little lamb's tail. So you take it off and you roll it up, and then you're ready to spin with it. And you would start at one end, and what you can do is just attach it to your piece that you've been working with. And I guess you can really see this because I'm using white against the gray. And you take the two and you meld them together. Spinning actually is quite a simple process. All it is is pulling uh, fiber out and twisting it. And there's many different ways to do this. It probably started out just somebody with a stick winding it up. And the malacate just makes it a little bit faster. As you can see, keep working at it. Eventually, as I said, you can meld the two pieces together and continue working as we keep going. Once you've spun enough onto the malacate, it's then time to take it off. And to do that, we use a tool called a nitty knotty. I love the name, nitty knotty, nitty knotty. And the nitty knotty is measured out so that if I take 40 rounds on this, I will get 50 yards. So it's nice to know, and that way you have a consistent um, skein of wool. To do the nitty knotty, you have to bear with me for a minute, I need to wind this down there. I put it on my feet. I'm sure if you had another person, they could hold it out for you and that would work just as well. There we go. Okay, I put it on my feet, bring it up, and then I start winding. And as you can see, that would be one round. And I go 40 times. And then that would, come on, buddy, give us our skein. And I would keep doing that, and I would hope that I have enough on my uh, malacate to give me 40. If not, it's easy just to take it and spin some more and twist it together. Once you're done spinning or putting it onto the nitty knotty, you then tie it with some kind of either some more of your rope or some warp or whatever, and you get a skein. As I said, this is 40 or 50 yards. The next step would be to wash the skein, and then we have racks and we stretch it and dry it because you see this is kind of curly and you want to take that curl out. So if you stretch it when it's wet, it dries and then it's not uh, curly anymore. And then it is ready for, uh, for dyeing, or you could just straight spin from it, whichever you want to do. Now, as I said, we've washed this wool. If you want something out of that's waterproof, you would spin the wool that uh, has not been washed. It is uh, we call it spinning in the grease. So you can make a poncho, and that actually would be water repellent. About 1880 is when the trains finally came to New Mexico, and they brought spinning wheels. And a spinning wheel does exactly the same thing as you do the spinning, as you pull, the twist, and I let go, the twist goes up into the part that I've pulled. So it really is just a game of pulling and twisting. A spinning wheel has the advantage of the malacate because the, the big wheel runs the fly, and as I'm spinning, it also winds up the, uh, the yarn so I don't have to stop and wind and stop and wind. So it is much quick, much faster. And that's, let's see, did I cover everything? Yes, any questions? No questions? No questions yet, Kathy. Oh no. Please ask me questions. Oh, you said something about fibers? 
Yes, we did have some questions that came in earlier by email after we advertised that you were going to be on today. Let me see if I can pull those up for you here. Um, this is a great question. Um, are there any animals, other animals besides our churro sheep that can be used in spinning and weaving? Yes. One of my favorites is alpaca. Alpaca is a wonderful fiber to spin. Uh, other ones that you can use. This uh, shawl that I'm sitting on is actually an alpaca uh, angora goat mix. And this was hand spun, hand dyed down in Mexico. So that's another type of fiber that can be done. Cotton also is spun. Uh, the Pueblo Native Americans did an extensive cotton spinning and uh, weaving here in New Mexico and their products, some of them are just beautiful. And were the native groups already spinning and weaving prior to I believe Spanish so. settlement? As, as far as I know, I think they, you know, spinning and weaving had been independently invented, quote, so to speak, around the world. So. so another question we have here is, you know, obviously this is a very historic process. This is something that here at Las Colondrinas, you and the fellow weavers demonstrate all the time when the museum is open. Um, majoritively, you're all women, except for a couple of our spinners. Now, we know that historically a lot of things were sectioned off according to gender. Can you talk a little bit about that in regards to weaving and spinning? Well, the spinning would have been, as I said, was starting with the young children. They would be the ones that would do the cleaning and carding. So you would have like your three and four year olds sitting around working. <clears throat> when the, the young girls got to be about eight or nine, then they would uh, be taught to spin with the malacate um, as with the other thing. And the young men, I think they did, tended to work more out in the fields. The weavers, in a lot of cases, were men. And I think if you have seen some of the looms here, you can kind of understand why. They're big, they're heavy, and that would have been one of the men's jobs. There were some women weavers. They probably wove the finer materials, but the uh, heavy-duty weaving, especially the for the wool, for the blankets and all, the men would do the weaving. How interesting. We had another question come through in our comments. Um, they're wondering what the malacate is made of, if you happen to know the type of wood, and if it was made by, handmade by a local carpenter. Yes, th I'm not sure of the wood. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the wood for this. But yes, it was made by someone, uh, I, said, I believe someone here on the ranch made this one. Uh, this is an especially nice one, so I'm really careful with it. But really, as I said, you can take any any piece of wood, a dowel rod, and make a whirl of some type. Uh, this one's out of wood. You could make one out of clay. I've seen clay uh, wheels or clay whirls on malacates. So it's uh, quite an easy thing to make. And then the trick is learning how to do it. Is yeah. it a hard process to learn? It takes a while. Spinning at first, it's like bike riding and swimming. You think, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I learned how, I taught myself on a drop spindle, and then I learned how to spin on the spinning wheel, and then like going from one step to the next. It's like, I can't do this, and I got proficient at that. When I came out here to Las Golondrinas, and I was told, oh, well, now you have to learn how to use the malacate. Well, you'd think after spinning for almost 20 years, eight years ago, it'd be no problem. It took me a while to figure out the technique, and it's because with a spinning wheel, the fiber is drawn in by the action of the wheel. So I don't have to do anything. The malacate, it actually bumps off the top. It's just a totally different type of spinning. And behind me, if you can see this, we have what's called a rueca. And this is the type of uh, spinning wheel that came up from Mexico. We know people that still use these. In fact, this. Uh, blanket that I'm sitting on, a shawl I'm sitting on was probably spun on a rueca. And it's kind of between a spinning wheel and a malacate. It works like a malacate, but you can wind up on it. So it is a little bit faster. Interesting. Well, we have people that are really curious about the things in the shot here. They're also wondering about the 
Rueca. Am Rueca. I saying that correctly? Rueca. Um, they're wondering if that was made by hand as well, or if that's something that a local carpenter would have made. Oh uh, yeah, a local carpenter would have made it. The problem, reason why they probably did not have one up here in the uh, colonial times is the scarcity of iron. And you notice there's some metal pieces on that, as with the spinning wheels. And that's another reason why the malacate was so good, is because it didn't take any metal, which um, was very scarce and used for cooking and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from our viewers? Kathy, you're just too good. You covered all the details. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, malacate, once you learn how to use it, is, is a lot of fun. It, does, it makes a beautiful product. If you've ever seen a Navajo woman spin on one of the, well, they have a different, the wheel's a little different. They're amazing. They may make me look like a novice. <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Oh, no. So we have a, a question came, coming through about um, the timing of this. Is this something um, that you personally do your, all year round? And also historically, is this something that people would have always been doing? Or is it something that's seasonally, like you have to wait for the batches of wool to come in and be ready? Well, the wool would be shorn in the spring, and then it would be washed and carted. And I suspect, depending on how many sheep you had, Spinning probably would go along, go on all year. Me personally, I spin all the time, and uh, at home, and I do weaving also. Um, so it, it is a year-round process. Oh, another great question. Yeah. Um, they're wondering, do they dye the wool before you spin it? You can. That's what's called. Uh, well, it'd be, uh, anyway, it can be dyed. It's harder to spin after it's been dyed because it tends to mat it up a little bit. Uh, what they would do is take uh, skeins. Now this is a this this is a uh, processed uh, commercially, so it's in a long um, thing. But usually, or if you could take the wool and have it clean and then dye it, uh, usually it's dyed as skeins. It's much easier to do uh, the wool. The, if you dye the wool that's not spun, it's, um, you, apparently it gives you a, a, a truer color that goes through. But as I said, the dyeing a skein is much easier because you have a lot more control over the particular um, each little item as you're working with it. And this blanket that I'm sitting, well, shawl I'm sitting on was dyed with indigo. And that's a, one of the, the dyes that we actually use here. This, this one was done in Mexico. It's beautiful. Thanks. Um, we have somebody wondering about the thickness of the, the yarn, how you, um, how you get it either as thin as you want or as thick as you want. That, all that is a matter of how much you pull out. Now I'm going to show you here. I've been pulling out maybe, oh, about half an inch at a time. Now if I want to get a much finer yarn, I would just pull out fewer f yarn, you know, fewer fibers. And I don't know whether you can see that, but it comes out much thinner. The trick is, is if you spin something with a finer uh, uh, make it, if you're spinning something that's finer, you have to put a lot more twist on it to hold it together. Otherwise, it'll just fall apart because the twist is what's holding it together. Also, the fact that sheep fibers have little barbs and the barbs are what hold itself together. And that's why sheep fiber is really one of the best ones to, uh, or has always been a successful one. You can spin yak, you can spin llamas. I said alpaca is my favorite. Um, I have spun dog. A friend of mine was spinning her uh, golden retriever yesterday and got beautiful yarn. I even spun some cat, but I had to, it was long-haired cat fiber, uh, but I had to mix it in with another fiber so that I had enough. 
So you really can spin anything that has, a, has a, enough of the length of the fiber. Um, so, yeah. That's so interesting. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, thank you. Um, somebody's wondering about cotton. You know, uh -huh. uh, so you mentioned you can spin cotton. Yes. Um, how prominent was that in New Mexico, and do you know when that came in? Well, as I said, the, the Pueblo Native Americans had cotton. They grew cotton. In fact, they still grow the cotton here, and they even had green cotton, brown cotton, white cotton. So the they spun uh, cotton here. I'm not really sure how far back into history it went. Uh, cotton uh, in India, they spun cotton. They still do China. And those kind of wheels, instead of being an upright wheel like this, is flat, looks like a box with a wheel. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of Gandhi. He, he was, used to do a lot of cotton spinning. So yes, cotton is one that uh, was done also. Uh, the Spanish colonials here did not use cotton as a, um, I don't think they used it that much. They mainly used the wool. They would use the fine wool uh, for fine products and then of course the heavy wool for heavier products. Wonderful, thank you, Kathy. Do we have any more questions from our viewers? All right, well, Kathy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and put my mask back on and I'm gonna rejoin you here. Okay. So there you have it, folks. Thanks again so much for joining us for this fourth installment of Golondrina's live sessions with Kathy Greco. I hope you all learned something. I know I learn something every time I come out and spend time with the weavers. Um, this really is one of our, our biggest programs and something that we demonstrate a lot here um, during regular museum times. Um, and it is quite a process, so that's why we've decided to do a few segments that cover weaving. A little bit later on this year, we're going to be covering dyeing. Somebody was asking about the how the if the wool has dyed before or after spinning, so we'll be covering that process too. And um, Kathy is also really good at that. She does a lot of our dyeing out here. Um, other announcements to make, some of you may already know this, who follow us right here on Facebook, on Instagram, if you're on our newsletter, we're very excited to announce that the museum is going to be partially reopening at limited capacity. Um, reservations are required. Uh, ticket sales, all the detailed information is available on our website, golondrinas.org. Um, our opening date is set for next week, Wednesday, September 9th. So we hope to see some of you out here and we'll be continuing that through at least September and coming back to you with more information on that. Um, we're going to continue to do these Golandrinas live sessions. We're also going to be introducing a couple of speakers. So, so far our videos have included some kind of a live demonstration, sort of a show and tell. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to welcome one of our board members, Dr. Tom Chavez, next Tuesday for a bit more of a, a historical non-demonstrative presentation. He's going to be talking about the Timeless Caravan, the story of survival and a rich heritage. Um, so Tom is a board member here at Las Colondrinas. He's a local historian and just an all-around really interesting guy to listen to about the history of New Mexico. Sorry guys, we get some planes coming overhead. We're always at the mercy of noise out here, being outside. Um, so again, check back right here on Facebook. Check out the previous Golandrina's live session videos we've done. Check back with us for details about Dr. Chavez's talk and some of the other videos that we have coming uh, to you throughout the rest of the year. Um, keep up with us on Instagram and Facebook at SF Golandrinas. And don't forget, your, uh, your adventure always starts at golandrinas.org. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kathy. Thank you all so much for spending some time with us here on this Friday afternoon. We wish you all a safe and happy holiday weekend. We'll see you next time.